Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Wireless Security for Water Wastewater Networks. Uh, this is co-hosted by ISA and Eaton. My name is Michaela Cooper, and I am with ISA, and I will be hosting today's webinar. Before we get started, I would like to review just a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's session. First, questions. Uh, please submit your questions at any time throughout the webinar. We will hold your questions till the Q&A session, which is at the end of the webinar. Uh, to submit your questions, simply type them into the chat toolbox on the right-hand side of your screen and send them into me, Michaela Cooper, the host. If you're viewing along with others at your site, please designate a scribe to submit your group's questions. And unfortunately, with this large of a group, we cannot open the phone lines for questions. If we do not get a chance to respond to your question, or if you would like to discuss a topic in more detail with one of the presenters, feel free to contact them directly, and that information will be given at the end of the webinar. And second, for those of you who just joined, please make sure that you are on mute. Both your computer and microphone should be on mute. If you would like to see the phone, phone and VoIP connection instructions again, please refer to the confirmation email that I sent you today. Or if you go to the top left-hand side of your WebEx screen, you'll see a tab labeled Meeting Info. All the connection instructions are included in there, including contact information if you're experiencing any technical difficulties. OK, I think that takes care of all of our housekeeping matters. Let's get started. Uh, I'd like our presenters to take it from here. Brian Cunningham? Great. Great, thank you, uh, Michaela. Um, and uh, do I have control of the PowerPoint to advance the slides? Yes, sir, you do. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, uh, as uh, Michaela mentioned, uh, my name is Brian Cunningham. I'm uh, dial dialing in from Vancouver, BC, where I uh, live and grew up. And a uh, quick uh, bit about my uh, background and history. I uh, went through the electronics technology at BCIT, where uh, uh, I took a specialty in process automation and instrumentation and uh, started a career that's now about 22 years uh, long. Uh, more specifically to do with wireless, uh, I've been with uh, a company called Omnex Control Systems, which later was acquired by Cooper Busman, which more recently has been acquired by Eaton, uh, and essentially uh, doing a role of applications engineering, uh, helping customers uh, specify wireless products, uh, install them, commission them, as well as uh, troubleshoot them uh, once they're in the field. So that's been my primary uh, background, and I've been doing this for uh, th for 13 years now. Okay, and Michaela, how do I advance the slide? Do I just click? Yes. Oh, there we go. Okay, great. And uh, Brian, uh, Brian Singer, go ahead. Well, today you get the Brian and Brian show, so hopefully we'll we'll be able to keep that straight for everybody. Uh, but this is Brian Singer. I am a principal investigator at Connexus Security. I uh, was the founding and I'm good, a previous co-chairman of the ISA 99 IEC 62443 Security Standard. I'm also the director-elect for the ISA Security and Safety Division. And I hold the CISM, the Certified Information Security Manager, Certified Information System Security Professional, and the Certified Imp Automation Professional uh, certifications. Uh, I've been in the field for just over 20 years, and I basically started out as an intel professional with the U.S. military, and I've been in industrial automation since the late 90s time frame. Uh, my background is primarily as a software developer, but uh, my pedigree is mostly in, in uh, industrial, excuse me, in, uh, uh, information security, industrial security, and also industrial networking. So quite a bit of experience in security assessments, network design, security program design, uh, in industrial control systems forensics, uh, as well as doing penetration tests. And at this point, uh, I've, I've had influence in programs or tests at over 3,000 plants worldwide. Yeah, that's great, Brian. Excellent. Thank you. And I hope uh, our audience uh, recognizes that uh, uh, we're certainly very privileged uh, to have a fellow like uh, Brian uh, joining us today with, uh, with his expertise. So moving on, uh, our uh, next uh, bit here is we just like to chat about our agenda, what we're uh, going to chat, uh, chat about for the next hour. 
And we're going to start off with a wireless hacking attack, uh, a case study of uh, what occurred uh, at a uh, Australian uh, treatment plant. Uh, next, we're going to talk about uh, why water utilities uh, are at risk and what some of the concerns uh, would be. Then we've got to uh, put some consideration into if there are these concerns, why are we using uh, wireless? Then we'd like to spend a couple of minutes in chatting about uh, making a, a wireless system reliable uh, and uh, what are some of the important uh, criteria to uh, review. Uh, then we're going to chat about uh, the protocols, uh, 802.11 and some of the other ones uh, that are out there, as well as proprietary uh, protocols that are developed by each manufacturer and what are the pros and cons associated with each. Then we're going to uh, talk about physical security uh, and information security which are two uh, key aspects. Uh, physical security uh, is generally sort of the number one step, and then we're going to chat about uh, making sure uh, uh, passwords and this sort of thing are all uh, kept appropriately. Uh, then we're going to chat about uh, encryption, uh, various types and methods of uh, encrypting uh, data, and then we're going to wrap it up with some resources, some other companies, uh, some other organizations, uh, some ISA uh, sources uh, that, we can, uh, that you can refer to that will... Uh, give you a little more information uh, if you want to explore the subject a little further on. Okay, so uh, moving on to the next one here. Uh, the, uh, the, one of the, the very first uh, wireless successful hacking attack that, uh, that we are aware of uh, occurred down in, uh, in Australia, uh, the Marucci Shire, a uh, small municipality. Uh, they, had a, they had hired a contractor to uh, install a new uh, wastewater uh, treatment uh, system or a new, pump, uh, new pumping SCADA system. And a uh, fellow who had worked for this uh, contractor uh, had a dispute with his uh, employer and with the, uh, with the Shire and uh, stole some software as well as hardware to be able to hack into this uh, system and to be able to do it uh, wirelessly. And it was quite interesting because at first the, uh, the water district did not realize that it was subject to a hacking attack. It had just assumed that these were startup bugs, that there was uh, problems with the SCADA system, with the programming or configuration of it. Until eventually they uh, came to realize this. And of course uh, they were able to uh, narrow down the case as to who had the technical skills and the know-how to be able to do it. And eventually the fellow was, uh, was arrested there. So uh, that was the very first hacking attack and proof that it can be done and that it can be done uh, wirelessly. Uh, Brian Singer, um, uh, would you like to add something here? Sure. I, I know that certainly that is a bit of a dated case at this point, and, and uh, if some of you on the phone may have actually heard about this one. Uh, but it is interesting because at this point I point out some of the number of, a number of the different vulnerabilities and weaknesses associated with a lot of water utilities or just in general. And I think Mr. Cunningham actually pointed out the main one there is that quite often when a utility or when any type of industrial automation environment is compromised, we don't recognize it. In fact, I've actually done quite a few incident responses, and it wasn't until months later that somebody even suspected there might be a cybersecurity compromise, and it still took some time after that to realize it. So a lot of times we spend, we're spending a lot of time with utility these days to help integrate as part of their overall diagnostic when the 5Y type analysis and, and various processes, that when they see erratic machine behavior or they see things going on that, were, that, that seem out of the norm, to basically to, to try to, to increase their level of inspection to see what, what other things may be going on in the network that might indicate that, that a cybersecurity or some other network uh, is a failure may be part of the root cause. Uh, and then the second bullet on this slide is that there has also been lots of reports of hacking of water utilities. There's been a rise of those over about the past year. Some of them, including the one actually mentioned here, end up being a bit of disinformation, so we already know about that. Some of them end up being valid. Uh, I will tell you this, that most of, the, most of the actual incidents have been relatively kept under wraps. Uh, I've been to a number of water utilities, all the way from the small municipality up to the larger conglomerates, and I, I, I will say that we have quite often both found evidence of malware, uh, things like viruses, worms, Trojan backdoors. We've seen uh, we've seen a number of cases where utilities are being are being scanned. Uh, basically, I, I will tell you that that, that you know, what is public in the, in the news and then the, what those of us as practitioners see don't necessarily match up, and that we are seeing quite a few uh, quite a few uh, cases of actual uh, attacks and compromises against water utilities that are ongoing. Some of them are known, some of them are not known. 
Uh, and I, there's also, if you go and you search on the web, you'll find quite a few other examples, including one that happened a few years ago at Harris, I think it was in 2006, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, had a water utility that was compromised by, if I remember correct, a backdoor installed on a, comp on a, a compromised uh, vendor la or, or, or a, a contractor laptop. So there are quite a few cases out there that have actually occurred. And even though we, this, this one about Marucci Shire is a bit dated, uh, it is the example, as Mr. Cunningham pointed out, of the first successful. And it, it, it also combined all of the things that we say we're watching out for when it comes to an industrial security incident. Somebody breaks in, somebody goes in and modifies the system. I believe that uh, Vatek Bowden actually modified his equipment to say, ma manifest itself as, as pump station number four, rather innocuous name, and then actually takes physical control using the valid industrial protocols to manipulate the system, which is how he spilled all the raw sewage. So uh, back over to you, Brian. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, moving on is uh, uh, just a quick uh, chat about uh, why uh, water utilities are at risk. And we've just uh, chatted about this a uh, little bit here, but uh, uh, Brian, why don't you uh, take the lead on uh, Brian Singer, why sure. don't you uh, take the lead on this one here? Sure, absolutely. And so there are four, four bullet points here, and they, these may seem a little bit aggressive, but I just want to make sure everybody understands that one, one of the main problems that we've seen raise up is that people have decided they want to be able to control their, their operations remotely. And where in the past we have used fairly closed networks, we're integrating more and more in towards Ethernet-based topologies. Um, at the bottom of the screen, you're going to see something here. And, and again, we all want to be cautious because I don't really want to call anybody necessarily out onto the carpet. But I went into a popular uh, search engine used by hackers a lot of times, an index of systems found out on the, the Internet, and I did a very, very simple search. All I did was type in water and see what came back. And you can see there that there is a list of systems that were found directly connected to the Internet. And how that happens is this, this points out that we see quite, a, quite often poor deployment integration practices, and especially in a lot of the, you know, uh, some of the smaller utilities a lot of times. People will tend to integrate things with like DSL modems or GPRS or other cell modems, or they may be using public networks in order to be able to reach those remote stations, and they're leaving the, connect, the equipment connected out there onto the Internet directly. And they don't realize that this is indexable and, and people can find this stuff on the web. Uh, certainly, water utilities are a potential interest of domestic and international terrorists. It's been that way, uh, been that way for quite some time. There are a number of, of, uh, there are a number of cases worldwide of, of water utilities being compromised for that purpose. And then again, a lot of times we have integrated a lot of these, these wireless utilities uh, we put wireless uh, technologies out there, but, uh, but we have not necessarily secured those properly. And for a long time, that was okay. They were fairly close protocols. They were fairly fairly close information. Uh, they weren't wasn't public. It wasn't on the internet. Uh, but as we continue to bring things like historians and additional controls in, and move our controllers and our HMIs more and more towards the Ethernet realm, and more distributed control of a utility over a large geographic area, we're seeing more and more of these issues pop up. So. Again, at the bottom of the screen, uh, just shows you what somebody with this even a very, very simple search could do and finding systems directly connected to the Internet. Now, the caveat here is don't try this at home. If you start actually connecting to those devices, you'll find out that they are valid and you can connect to them and you can use the industrial protocols. So uh, I don't know about everybody on the phone, but jail is not necessarily part of my retirement program. And I definitely want to make sure that if people see information like this, that they don't just turn around and start using it. Uh, there, it, it definitely gets into a very gray area very quickly. So either way, we just see that there, there's a, a high proliferation of systems on the Internet. They're network accessible and a lot of insecure practices out there. And, and as a result, a lot of water utilities are, are at risk in one way or another. Yeah, good point. Uh, this is all very good, uh, good to know. Okay, so uh, the next uh, thing uh, we wanted to chat about for a few minutes here is uh, why wireless? Uh, why would you use this uh, if, uh, if apparently it can be hacked into and people can uh, get into your uh, network uh, through that? And I think the, the, by far the biggest reason uh, is simply cost. Uh, it's simply uh, uh, less expensive to do uh, especially long-range, uh, long-distance applications, uh, but also it allows you a better control and monitoring. Uh, you're now able to install more sensors because the cost of the cable to get that uh, signal back to the control room where the SCADA master is, uh, is a lot lower. Uh, we uh, see that uh, leased telephone lines have uh, monthly charges and uh, can be very expensive, and uh, uh, phone utility companies have been notorious for making changes to a circuit 
and all of a sudden disrupting uh, service until a telephone call from the uh, water utility uh, gets them to restore it. So there's certainly been, uh, from my perspective, I heard a lot of complaints about uh, the reliability of, uh, of leased uh, phone lines. Also, if we're going to uh, hardwire uh, a uh, sensor in, uh, we uh, need to, a lot of times, we need to uh, either dig a trench, and that can be uh, very expensive, as well as uh, the actual cable itself with the price of copper uh, today. And then uh, lastly, we have a lot more regulatory requirements in place today than we did uh, 10 or 20 years ago, which means that we have to install more sensors throughout a network, and more sensors mean uh, more uh, communications. So, uh, the primary reasons here are uh, are going to be uh, cost, but it is also driven by uh, regulatory uh, regulatory uh, requirements. So there's two uh, sort of focuses here. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, wireless networks in the treatment plants themselves, just connecting different pieces of instrumentation over an area of a couple of acres uh, where uh, all the treatment equipment uh, will be uh, equipped. And then moving on to this next one, this is your uh, uh, your typical uh, pump station out kind of in the middle of a residential uh, neighborhood. And sometimes these can be a couple of miles apart. And uh, to be able to uh, get systems to communicate over when the distance is measured in miles uh, becomes extremely expensive and uh, in some cases cost prohibitive. So back uh, many, many years ago, and uh, this still occurs in, in quite a few countries around the world, is they just do manual readings. Uh, a fellow jumps in a uh, vehicle and uh, drives around and makes, makes uh, uh, measurements of uh, you know, liquid level or whatnot in uh, water store, potable water storage tanks and just drives around and uh, does that. Uh, here in North America or in Europe and many other countries, uh, with the cost of labor, that's uh, extremely expensive. Uh, and then lastly, uh, some wireless systems, uh, if it's a non-programmable system, uh, you can have it installed in about half a, half a day. So uh, to be able to get up and running, uh, by comparison, if a hardwired link breaks, it requires that you uh, essentially uh, pull out some trenching equipment and start uh, digging down. So uh, uh, certainly some significant uh, cost savings. Uh, Brian Singer, uh, anything to add here? Sure. Uh, I think the, the, the one thing, there, there's a corollary study that was published by Oak Ridge National Laboratories a few years ago. Uh, this is more for the, power, for the nuclear power industry, but it's a relevant study. that we see that the total cost of ownership in a nuclear power utility tended to exceed $4,000 per linear foot of network cable for a full, uh, for a full hardwired network. Now, obviously, in the water utility, they're not going to have nearly the same validation cost. However, when you start breaking down all of the things that make up that total cost of ownership, the cost factor associated with hardwired networks is very high. So we want to make sure that you know, the, the wireless definitely offers a lot of benefits in that department. Now, as far as why wireless and, and you know, should we go wireless, should we continue to push down this route if there are insecurities? And what we have seen, in, 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 you know, from uh, historically looking here, is that the benefits of integrated systems and for better information, for being able to control a utility remotely without having to roll a truck out to every individual meter, every individual pump station, every individual drive, that, that whenever something needs to be done, the, the, the cost, benefits, and savings far outweigh the risks in most cases for a well-designed system. So I'm definitely an advocate of saying let's push for the fit-for-purpose solution and bring things like wireless technology in if there's a good cost driver, but let's make sure that we aren't introducing unnecessary security risks. So I, I always say that in a, in a properly managed environment, there is no reason not to have that type of integration as long as you make sure that we cover the security aspects, and that really is not that difficult to do if you, if you plan properly for the deployment. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, and, and, and like many things in life, uh, if it's done well and it's done properly and thought out uh, appropriately, uh, it can work very, very well. Okay, uh, the next thing uh, we wanted to uh, chat about was uh, reliable radio. Uh, because uh, ultimately, uh, if the radio system doesn't work, it frankly is just not very uh, useful. And there's a number of different uh, things to, uh, to keep in mind to, to, to make a system reliable and, uh, and secure. One of the first things is, uh, uh, do you decide to go on a fixed frequency radio system that uses a license that you would purchase from uh, either FCC in the U.S. or Industry Canada up here uh, in uh, Canada, or... Uh, would you like to go on a license-free band uh, and use perhaps a frequency-hopping uh, radio system? 
Uh, there's a number of uh, pros and cons uh, between the two. Uh, fixed frequency radios can be very secure or very reliable, I should say, uh, in theory, because uh, the government regulates who else can use uh, that particular frequency. But the reality on the ground is that uh, it does take some time. And in other words, it uh, can be a couple of days uh, before somebody comes out and uh, determines that interference is an issue and does a triangulation and actually figures out where the uh, the problem transmitter uh, could be or the illegal transmitter who's using your frequency could be located. Located. So it uh, can work uh, very well, and in some cases, uh, due to the distance required and the ability to get some uh, significant ranges uh, out of fixed frequency uh, radios, sometimes they're pretty much the only option. However, a lot of customers are going with uh, license-free radios or unlicensed radios because you don't need to contact the FCC. You can install them anywhere uh, in your facility, uh, and they're uh, no regulatory hassles is uh, is the is the best way to uh, describe it. However, within that category, there are a number of different types of uh, license-free uh, radios, and I'm showing just two of them uh, in that uh, in the left-hand corner: a frequency hopper and then a direct sequence uh, radio system. And of course, you can probably guess that uh, where how wide the filters have to be set on the two will dr will vary quite dramatically. And, of course, the narrower the uh, slice of frequency that's used and the fact that the frequency hoppers hop around tend to make them very reliable, very resilient radio systems when there's other radios uh, being utilized. Then another thing to think about is uh, the 2.4 gigahertz uh, band. And given that uh, 2.4 gigahertz radios are installed in every laptop that's uh, sold across the country, um, you might want to uh, think about, uh, is that going to really be suitable for the application? And again, just as Brian Singer mentioned a couple of minutes ago, uh, a lot of these radios have become application-specific. You really do need to ask a lot of questions and figure out which is the best uh, for a particular unique case. Then we have uh, cellular modems, which are uh, great products when a point-to-point -point radio link uh, is uh, not practical uh, due to the distance or obstructions. But you are uh, relying on the cellular provider to uh, make sure that he's got suitable bandwidth for you and uh, hope that uh, you don't have a whole bunch of iPhones or whatnot uh, roaming into that area and overwhelming an individual cellular tower with too much data traffic or whatnot there. And uh, then we need to think about the background noise. And the uh, screen capture in the lower right-hand uh, corner is uh, something I took just outside of a facility that was doing uh, uh, wireless tank gauging. And uh, the, this uh, device was, uh, uh, this was a, uh, a USB-based spectrum analyzer that I purchased from a company called uh, MetaGeek. And it allows anybody with a laptop and a USB port now to be able to scan the spectrum and see what kind of interference uh, there is uh, in the area. And of course, your signal has to be stronger than the noise there. So this allows you to pick the right frequencies to be able to uh, utilize. And that screen capture shows a particularly noisy environment. Uh, then we have antenna selection, and uh, uh, it's uh, always a best idea to use Yagi directional antennas uh, where possible. And that's because uh, Yagi directional antennas need to be aimed in the specific direction that they will be transmitting and receiving in. And uh, that means that they will be uh, deaf or unable to, uh, un uh, unaffected by interference coming at it from other directions, or I should say uh, less affected by interference coming at it from other directions. So it makes it more difficult to, uh, uh, to, to jam this type of radio system or, or whatnot there. Uh, Brian, uh, Brian Singer, uh, what uh, what would you like to add here? Sure, a couple of things. I, I guess, number one, from a water wastewater perspective, uh, if you're at a utility that is not currently using a heavy amount of wireless, especially long haul, there's the things you're going to need to pay attention to here, obviously. You're going to want to be in touch with the FCC and the FAA, especially if you're in a, a heavy, you know, in city environments, because you're going to want to make sure that you're not causing harmful interference or that you're not being interfered with with other critical communications. So a lot, of large, a lot of utilities in larger cities in particular are fairly used to dealing with this, and they'll be using either Yagi or Grid or Dish antennas to shape the beam of their communications as narrow as poss possible so that there's a, a high forward-powered lobe off of the device. There's, there's not a, hopefully not much of a side lobe off of the antennas so that they're basically shaping the communications or causing as little interference as possible. Uh, and as Mr. Cunningham pointed out, I would use directional antennas where you can, especially 
when you're doing point-to-point -point communications across a distance. Number one, you're probably going to have to. Number two, you're, you're, you're limiting the possibility of, of emissions that, that somebody could pick up. Uh, and I know that one other thing that especially I've seen this in a lot of utilities that are using, uh, are using wireless within the four walls of a building or a, a group of buildings, uh, they may say, well, we'll just turn the power down on the radios and we'll have to worry. If, if we can't read it with a laptop outside of the building, then we don't have to worry about somebody using that wireless against us and they may not secure it. So again, using these antennas, uh, we can actually send, I think at, at 10 milliwatts, we've still been able to send 8 or 2.11 signals up to a couple of miles without much difficulty uh, using a very good quality antenna. Uh, if any of you are ham radio operators, you know it's not as much about the power you put out, it's about the quality of the antenna, and the same thing holds true in the wireless spectrum as well, uh, in the wireless arena as well. So we want to make sure that even though if, if, we're, if we're using wireless technologies, I would say it's probably, you know, not, the, the first aspect of security is to make sure that we actually secure the wireless network. The second aspect is to make sure that we send the RF communications only as far as they need to go, and we, and we manage that spectrum very carefully as well. Yeah, yeah, great points, great points, yep. Okay, uh, next uh, I wanted to chat about uh, uh, public versus uh, proprietary uh, wireless protocols. And one of the first discussions or things to think about here uh, are uh, why, why a proprietary uh, protocol? Uh, manufacturers of uh, radios and, and wireless products and, of course, all other kinds of hardwired uh, devices uh, develop their own uh, protocols. And in the wireless world, there's uh, a couple of specific reasons why, they, why manufacturers would spend you know, a year or two or more of engineering time to develop their own uh, protocol. And usually it's to do with overhead. Uh, 802.11 uh, A, B, and G, uh, approximately 50% of the transmissions is just the overhead of the uh, access points, uh, establishing links with uh, clients and authenticating them and uh, this sort of thing. And that's because 802.11 was designed to do everything from uh, uh, surfing the Internet to uh, Skype to just you know everything uh, under the sun. So unfortunately, it's not terribly efficient. Uh, but the, re most, the biggest reason most manufacturers make proprietary protocols is uh, so that they can dedicate uh, more bandwidth to actual uh, user data. Uh, now, of course, the the uh, negative, uh, the the con to a proprietary protocol is uh, the commercial aspect. Is that and that is that you have a single manufacturer who's uh, supplying this this equipment. Uh, does not allow you to uh, shop around, and you are uh, uh, potentially vulnerable uh, should that uh, manufacturer have any uh, you know business difficulties or or, or whatnot. So in uh, in certain uh, some respects, uh, public protocols become uh, very attractive uh, because uh, you you have competitive uh, pressure. You can buy equipment from multiple manufacturers and all have it uh, communicate together and take advantage of the unique features that uh, each uh, manufacturer may have built into their uh, particular uh, devices. Now, in terms of uh, uh, security, uh, proprietary protocol uh, means that a hacker must learn a new language. So he's got to study the, uh, uh, the product. He has to uh, potentially sit and monitor uh, transmissions for some period of time. And he's got to be able to figure out what that new language is uh, and before he can uh, spoof it or hack it or, uh, or, or whatnot. So it, it does add a, an additional step. It, in some cases, it's a small step, uh, depending on the complexity of the protocol. Uh, but it is a, an additional step. So certainly... You know pros and cons uh, uh, associated with uh, both public and uh, proprietary uh, protocols. Uh, Brian, what's your uh, Brian Singer? What's your uh, uh, take on that? Sure, thanks. I, I think that you know again, I'm not going to say whether the public or proprietary is going to be good, bad, or indifferent well, because compared to each other. I think in, in any given situation, there's always a technology that is going to be fit for purpose. So I, I'm more about encouraging folks to go through a solid design process and a, and a good vendor and technology selection process to make sure that they pick the appropriate technology. We do see a lot of, pro, of proprietary technology used in water wastewater environments, and there's a lot of reasons for that. So on the pro side of that is kind of some of the things that Mr. Cunningham pointed out, that yes, we see that, that, you know, that, um, that you know, they are going to be harder to intercept. But there's also another aspect, too, is that typically when they're a proprietary technology, the vendors do have more control over the hardware that's actually being used. 
And so you get a fairly reliable communication because it's always the same chipset, it's always the same communication technology. Uh, and, and actually, we did a study with a um, um, well, we did a study with a, a smart meter company a few years ago that does smart meters for water, wastewater, also power and oil and gas. And the, the one thing I would tell you that is that it definitely does create a higher work factor for somebody that wants to compromise the environment. And one of the studies that we were commissioned to do was take somebody with reasonable RF and electrical engineering skills and just give them a meter and do some behind the glass testing to just to figure out what would it take for somebody with moderate skill to be able to reverse uh, engineer the technology and communications and be able to create a wormable surface, something that we could actually compromise. And essentially, with one person working on this with those skills, it took them about four and a half to five weeks for them to do the reverse engineer all the schematics, protocol specification, and to come up with an attack vector for that component. So obviously, it's not out of the realm of possibility, but it's not as simple as downloading the latest aircraft tool from the Internet and then going after a smart meter. So it definitely does raise the bar. Um, now, as we kind of look on this on the, on the public side, and there are some advantages to the public side. Number one, you don't have to worry about vendors necessarily going away or no longer supporting equipment or, or equipment being as outdated. Uh, there also certainly is going to be ease of use and for people being able to support it better. There's also going to be lots of diagnostic tools out there for the public technologies. But some of the downsides to public uh, technologies is, uh, number one, there is more information about them. There's more public to information about how to compromise them. And we also see, uh, as, a, as, a, as the opposite side of the, the proprietary side on hardware, uh, when I was at Rockwell Automation a few years ago, there was a stunning commission that was comparing the quality in a noise environment, in a, in a, basically in a noise chamber, comparing the quality of communications using robust industrial-grade gear versus using commercial off-the-grade Best Buy equipment. No, that's not Best Buy type grade. You know, it, it, it starts calling out saying that that technology is bad. In fact, in a home environment, it's going to be just fine. But most of our industrial environments are very noisy environments. There's high voltage drives, there's medium, you know, there's, there's lots of fluorescent lights, there's all kinds of other things going on that could be interfering with the technology. And the study basically concluded that there was a dramatic drop off in performance and reliability when you were using lesser grade components. So one of the problems you have to watch out for, again, if you're selecting a public technology, is you want to make sure that you're still selecting high quality uh, electrical components to make sure that you are uh, that you're going to be able to perform at the level that you wish. So I guess just in summary on that is again it really is just a matter of what is fit for purpose for your individual application and make sure that you follow a solid design and technology selection process to make sure that it's going to work work appropriately for you. Yeah, that's right, uh, and I, I would I would emphasize that as well. Uh, fit for purpose, I think, is the uh, uh, is the key uh, word here. And uh, w one other uh, point that I've certainly experienced uh, personally a number of times, and uh, and that is, what is the difference between a radio that costs a thousand dollars and a radio that costs uh, fifty dollars or a hundred dollars? And uh, from a manufacturing perspective, uh, it is primarily the uh, quality of the components that goes into it, uh, and specifically the filtering that the radios utilize. Uh, High-quality uh, radios for industrial uh, mission-critical applications, they use multiple levels of filters. And in some of the radios that, uh, uh, that uh, Eaton manufactures, uh, the filters are the most expensive product or most expensive component on the circuit board. And that's because they have to work uh, 24 hours a day. So that is uh, the difference between industrial grade and uh, consumer grade uh, uh, products there. Okay, one of the things to chat about uh, next is uh, physical security. Uh, we uh, felt it appropriate that we have a brief chat about uh, uh, doing physical security because, frankly, if uh, equipment isn't locked in and you can uh, walk into a pump station and sort of uh, jimmy the door open, and you can plug into a physical Ethernet port, why would you bother hacking wirelessly? So we wanted to chat about that because that should be step number one, is physically securing the uh, the premises. So we uh, see these little pump stations uh, that are uh, situated in residential neighborhoods that are unmanned, and uh, if there's no uh, video surveillance or any alarming, of course, somebody can just uh, you know break into them and, uh, and uh, plug uh, right in. So uh, these would be the same issues that they have as uh, uh, to prevent uh, vandalism. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, of course, a, a key aspect is uh, when an employee or a contractor leaves the organization, particularly if they are disgruntled or it was not uh, done on, uh, on positive uh, terms, 
make sure that the keys are changed and, uh, and the passwords are, are updated. And also, uh, we always recommend using uh, physical keys that cannot be copied. Uh, just to prevent somebody from uh, wandering down to uh, Home Depot and uh, getting a copy of all the keys to the various uh, pump stations and then getting very, uh, uh, very easy uh, physical uh, access. Uh, Mr. Singer, any uh, experiences in this, uh, in this realm? Sure. I I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit, and uh, we're going to talk about firewalls just a moment, uh, and, and it is relevant. Uh, I did a study with a, a large pipeline a couple of years ago, and they were using something that, that many of the folks on the phone today may be using as well, which is a centralized firewall methodology, which essentially says they're going to have, they, they say we have a secured industrial network, they park a firewall in a data center, and then they set up all the routes and all the, the routers and all the remote stations to basically direct all traffic back to the, command, back to, the, uh, uh, to the data center through that corporate firewall to be inspected before going back out to the remote site. There's a fairly common deployment out there. So in other words, uh, it, there's no firewall at any, any, each individual remote site. They all go back through one central one. Well, that's all well and good. You get a central point of monitoring, ease of use for, 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 for being able to manage the environment. But when we did this pipeline study, it highlighted one of the weaknesses of this methodology, which was if I go into one of the remote stations and find out that an engineer has changed the routes in all of the router, and now all of these remote sites can talk to each other because the engineer doesn't want to have to go drive out to each individual site or whatever, well, guess what? You just bypass that firewall. A firewall will only work if you route the communications to be inspected through it. And uh, that's exactly what we ran into was in this pipeline, there was one engineer that wanted to be able to support lots of different uh, of his, of his remote stations without having to go through the firewall, didn't go any other rigmarole. And he set up all of those routes himself so he can make all those network communications. And so essentially during our penetration test, we went through at one of the remote stations, we gained access to the network, and then we were able to shut down and cause, well, we were able to simulate, obviously, a shutdown and compromise of the entire pipeline by breaking into one of these remote stations. But here's where I'll bring it back into the physical security that says, often some of the lowest cost and most effective measures we can put in place are physical security. So in the case that I was just talking about, we want to make sure that people can't get into those remote locations and then can use those as a point of compromise to the whole rest of the system, bypassing all these great security mechanisms you may have put in place. Uh, now, again, if you look at the power utilities, you look at what's going on there, then in most of those places they have put you know, video and uh, video and motion sensing, sensing uh, monitoring in all of their remote stations. Most water utilities don't necessarily have the budget, or maybe it just doesn't even dictate that that's the appropriate solution for their environments. What I have seen a lot of water utilities do is if they aren't going to do video or motion sensing monitoring, many of them have just put in door and window sensors and integrated it as part of the alarm in the SCADA system. So that if somebody goes out and breaks into one of these remote locations, or if they open up a door and they're not supposed to, a alarm will get triggered at the central remote op or at the central uh, um, SCADA terminal, so at the control room, and people will be able to see, well, hey, wait a minute, why is somebody physically entering this facility? Why does it matter? Well, it matters because not only can they cause physical damage to the facility, but just as the example above, you know, they, they might use these remote facilities as a point of access for a cybersecurity compromise as well. Yeah, that's the uh, uh, yeah, excellent uh, points there. And one of the things I've also seen is uh, uh, door switches on the electrical cabinet itself, the uh, cabinet that houses uh, your uh, radio system and PLC and uh, and all of the electrical equipment. A switch on the the cabinet door, so such that if the pump station is particularly large and there are uh, possibly a number of different contractors that may come in to do uh, routine maintenance, that you can know that uh, none of them have opened that cabinet to get physical access to a, uh, a SCADA system. So I've seen that as another uh, trick that uh, some uh, uh, some networks have uh, utilized. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next is uh, information uh, security. And uh, uh, here, these are these are some fairly uh, standard uh, things about uh, maintaining uh, access control and authorization. And uh, particularly when employees leave or contractors have uh, finished a job, uh, as uh, was the case with uh, that gentleman that uh, hacked into that system and that uh, uh, of the wastewater system down in Australia. Uh, he had uh, ultimately inside knowledge, and they did not uh, change access control or, or have control of access rights, which allowed him to be able to get into the system, even though the project had been completed and he was no longer with the organization. 
The next thing is uh, is passwords. And uh, the longer, the more complicated passwords there are, uh, the more effective uh, they become. There are types of attacks called dictionary attacks, where people use common words and common phrases as the most likely passwords that people will use. And this, of course, is the reason why uh, many large uh, companies now require these very complicated, and some people have thought ridiculously long, ridiculously complicated uh, passwords. Well, there are good reasons why uh, companies do enforce these uh, policies as well as requiring you to change them and not repeat uh, passwords and, and use uh, passwords that are not uh, common words to, uh, uh, to avoid these types of uh, problems here. So, uh, uh, Brian, what have your experiences? Uh, Brian, Mr. Singer, what have your experiences uh, been here? Sure. Uh, well, so I think, you know, when you look at um, the security is obviously a fairly wide and comprehensive do uh, discipline, and you can't just say, well, we're just going to implement a password policy and that will take care of everything, or you can't implement it, we're going to do a firewall. And if it's, it's a, if we're going to implement a firewall and we're going to be okay. You definitely have to make sure that you look at all the various aspects out there. And you want to hit on a couple of them. One of the, one of the main areas I make sure utilities really focus on, because it tends to be an area of weakness, is hire and fire policies. What it makes sure that they're granting and removing access when things, when things change. And this doesn't just mean their user account. If they have access to group passwords, like to a control room, or for example, network administrators leave and they use the same password on all the switches out there, you can't just dis disable their access. You need to go through and you need to change it to all your switches and firewalls and things as well. In fact, I actually had two days before Christmas, uh, four years ago, I actually got called in for an incident response where somebody had been let go, and he did exactly that. He went and changed all the passwords and all the all of the firewalls and switches and servers and everything else on his way out the door, and then basically left the company and left them in a lurch. So somebody had to come in there and help bail them out. So again, you, making sure that you that you follow good hire and fire policies is always a good procedure. Make sure that you change those passwords. Um, then I think the one thing I will talk about, another main issue that we see out there is people making unauthorized changes or bringing unauthorized devices onto the network, bringing their own laptops, cell phones, iPads, tablets, whatever, blueberries, blackberries, you could pick whatever your favorite device is. We're seeing a lot more of that. And people say, well, hey, well, this would be great. All this terminal service is in through my phone, and I don't have to worry about all this stuff. Or people bring in engineering laptops and they plug them up to the wrong network and they change the wrong controller and then you spend the rest of your day trying to figure out what was changed. These are issues that I would imagine most of the people on the phone have probably dealt with at one point or another. So one of the great technologies out there, if, you have the, if, if you're willing to implement it, is 802.1x. You can implement this with a lot of the switches and with the access clients. So that makes sure that as people bring computers or laptops or other devices in, they have to meet a minimum set of security requirements in order to be able to participate on the network. If they plug up to the network and they don't have the right keys to the kingdom, then guess what? They are denied access, or they've, in some cases people give them like a uh, protected guest access. So they don't have access to any of your actual sensitive data, but they're given like a, 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 you know, a guest area account that allows them to own the web or something of that nature. Uh, 802.1x is a great technology for doing that. And again, we can actually lock people down by making sure that they're only using valid, uh, valid workstations, they're only using valid devices, they've, they've got the right encryption keys, uh, they have antivirus on their machine, they've run a virus check, their patches are up to date. You can do a lot of that through things like 802.1x. And while it's not on the slide, I would also mention the group policy object inside of Active Directory and being able to manage user accounts. And we, get, we can get really granular with group policy objects and make sure that there again, another issue we, we run into is people using USB drives. With There's other third-party software solutions out there, but we also can do this with group policy objects. We can make sure that people can't just bring USB drives into the environment and either walk out with our data or on accident bring viruses in, which has happened way, way too often. In fact, if anybody's familiar with the Stuxnet attack, it was the most, it's the most famous piece of malware out there these days. It was uh, targeting, it was supposedly targeting a uh, Iranian nuclear facility. Uh, Basically, Stuxnet, one of its main mechanisms for getting onto the system was through USB drive. So there, there are a lot of technologies out there that will allow us to lock things down to make sure that we can control who's gaining access, what they're doing, and what they're doing with that access once, they, once they're on the network. Great. Uh, Brian, any uh, recommendations for at what point uh, an uh, organization think, should think about using a radio server? Um, I think a lot of that's going to be that depends upon the technologies they have in place and then obviously their budget. I, I would say that if you are worried about uh, a strong authentication models, that you want to make sure that you know who is gaining access to your system and you want to have heavy logging. So 
it, pretty much anybody that has uh, that has remote connectivity and lots of people working for them, uh, they're going to want to have some type of, of strong authentication model, and radius servers start to make sense for that. Now, what size of, of utility does that, does that really start at? It's probably going to start at the larger, municipal, mean, larger municipalities, easy for me to say, uh, or the, the, the larger utilities in, in the major cities. They're going to start looking at that. At the lower levels, uh, where especially there are not that many people working in the utility, uh, radius would probably be a bit of overkill in most cases, unless you're in a situation where you have a lot of remote support users. So let's say you only have four or five people operating the utility, but you got you know 25 contractors from several different vendors that are actually doing it. Then some of those those some of those servers might start to make sense again as well. Oh, great. Yeah, good. Thanks. Uh, yeah, good to know uh, where uh, where where do you where you draw the line for that uh, uh, that sort of thing. Okay, the next thing uh, we wanted to chat about was uh, the types of wireless attacks uh, that uh, can occur. And uh, uh, I'll start off with uh, just describing a couple of them. Uh, uh, first of all, there's a man in the middle, and that's uh, where a, a rogue access point is, uh, is, is configured and uh, fools clients into sending their uh, security uh, credentials. Uh, then we have uh, dictionary attacks, which, uh, uh, as I described a little bit earlier, uh, it's essentially trying to guess passwords using uh, dictionary words or common uh, phrases. Just plows through them. It's almost a brute uh, force uh, attack, uh, and just plows through all the common uh, passwords to find a somebody who's used a weak uh, uh, weak password. Then we have uh, denial of service, and uh, also ultimately, uh, I'm sure a lot of lots of people have heard that uh, it's uh, you know in relation to uh, websites, uh, it's where it, it, a network is flooded with requests such that uh, it cannot uh, respond to other legitimate uh, users, and that's uh, very similar to the very last one, harmful infer harmful interference. And I think, Brian, uh, uh, Mr. Singer, with your uh, military experience, you might be able to uh, tell us a few uh, stories on that. Well, certainly. I think, you know, obviously one of the first things you can do if you want to stop somebody from operating a wireless communication is just send out a larger, uh, larger, more powerful signal in the same, space, same area, and that's just your typical RF jamming techniques. And we've actually seen, there was some research done a couple of years ago um, by Jake Brodsky at the WSSC and Tony McConnell. There's public information on that. And they talked about uh, the jamming the, I believe it was the, uh, the 15.4 communications. So it's basically, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm over-trivializing this, but it was essentially a nine volt battery and a Yagi antenna and a little bit of, of, of uh, and a little bit of creative, creative technology beyond that point. And it shows that if I want to be able to stop your communications, one of the things I can just do is just jam the signal. So uh, we've seen lots of, of, of cases of that. In fact, that's actually something that's been well known for quite a while. Uh, but it, definitely there's been quite a few attacks shown against mesh communications like uh, Zigbee or HSS or some others by just simply going out and introducing a harmful signal out there that then denies the operation of all those different uh, different endpoints. Great, great. Okay, excellent. Yeah, yeah certainly uh, uh, jamming the airwaves is probably the, one of the most common things that's uh, been around for uh, for quite some time. Okay, so next uh, we wanted to uh, chat about uh, encryption, uh, just the whole uh, the whole idea of uh, being able to prevent uh, anyone else from understanding the meaning of uh, messages. And uh, it's important to measure the effectiveness of encryption. And there's two primary uh, criteria uh, to measure the effectiveness, and one is the processing power required by the electronics or the microprocessor to be able to encrypt and then decrypt uh, each message. Uh, if it requires an excessive amount of processing uh, ability, it will slow down the network uh, uh, quite significantly. And, uh, of course, it will bog down the computer system and increase the processing uh, uh, speeds that we require for our uh, computers and RTUs and, and, and uh, PLCs. So sometimes that can certainly be a, uh, a downfall of an, of an encryption uh, technique. And the second aspect is uh, it must not increase the message length uh, beyond a, a desirable uh, size. And this is uh, particularly critical with wireless communications because we do not have as much bandwidth as we have available for hardwired uh, communications. And also uh, another uh, uh, aspect, uh, uh, a uh, fundamental uh, rule of, uh, of all radio systems, regardless of modulation technique or frequency, and that is that as the throughput of a radio system increases, 
the sensitivity of the receiver must decrease and as a result, uh, it requires a stronger signal. So there is tremendous motivation on the, uh, uh, for manufacturers of radio systems to uh, make a radio system that uses as little bandwidth as possible uh, to be able to uh, have, allow for the most sensitive receiver and therefore the maximum range to get a much greater distance out of that uh, radio system. So this is where encryption uh, sort of handicaps those things. So it, it is very closely uh, reviewed uh, before we uh, implement it in a uh, in a radio system here. Uh, uh, Mr. Singer, what what have your experiences uh, been here? Sure. One of the other issues you have to watch out for with encryption is uh, is on the key management side, and then also you are, you already pointed out there too much processing power for encrypt and decrypt. So we, we see especially in like freshwater monitoring stations. I, I you know some folks may be deal, if you're familiar with dealing with those here in this this call. Uh, we typically have fairly low-power devices. They're going to be run off solar or something like that. Uh, or we may be using smart meter communications and AMR. And again, you're going to have fairly low processing power. So we need to have an encryption mechanism, an encryption scheme that's going to work effectively. But the other problem we run into there also is key management. And so we're seeing this in, uh, in the NIST smart grid standards where they're doing a lot of the defining work for what automated meters and smart meters are going to need to be able to do to support the smart grid. There again, we're using the same smart meters for a lot of our activities in the water, wastewater, and pipeline businesses. Uh, we want to make sure they, that um, they're, excuse me, they're, the, um, the mathematical models on encryption key management start to break down at about one million keys that need to be managed. Well, most municipalities, municipalities probably are going to have less than that as far as users. However, the problem they run into is that you're typically going to need multiple encryption keys per device. So again, well, some companies are finding that it's, becomes a, it's becoming a very onerous process to manage all those encryption keys because you may have anywhere from 2 to 12 encryption keys on an individual device, and they're going to need to be able to manage that somehow. So, so definitely any, any technology you select in this field is going to have to have – you're going to need encryption for a variety of different reasons. In fact, it's being required by law in some cases, uh, but we're also going to need to make sure that we don't create for ourselves a technological nightmare in terms of managing all of those keys. Great. Okay. So let's uh, move right on and uh, start talking about some of the different uh, encryption uh, methods here. And uh, I'll start with uh, by chatting about uh, WEP uh, encryption or uh, wired equivalency uh, uh, privacy. And uh, I'm sure most of you are probably aware from, uh, uh, from having uh, Wi-Fi hotspots uh, at your house and uh, laptops that uh, you and your family or kids may uh, utilize to uh, uh, communicate and that uh, it's not considered a secure uh, encryption uh, method. In fact, uh, because it is a, a, uh, uh, you know, a public uh, uh, protocol and very, very widely uh, utilized, uh, programs like AirSnort have been uh, created that allow you to hack into it. So it can be cracked in a couple of minutes or less, and I think Brian's even got a story of how he's been able to hack it uh, e even in less than a minute here. So we'd certainly recommend, uh, as a minimum, uh, WPA uh, encryption uh, be utilized, uh, or WPA2, which is uh, uh, newer and even more secure than uh, WE, uh, WEP. Uh, Brian, uh, what, uh, uh, how, how would you like to chat about WPA? Sure. Uh, so I guess the first thing to say here, too, is you have to remember when we start talking about breaking encryption, you're into a whole different spectrum of secure security. Um, and so a lot of what, you, what you'll see, like between WPA and WPA2, or using the AES mechanism versus using TKIP, is that a lot of times what we'll see is we'll see theoretical weaknesses that are demonstrated in the key space and being able to – the idea in encryption, if I can break your keys, then I'm able to read all the communication. So without having a very long discussion on crypto here today, uh, but again, what we're trying to do in each one of these scenarios is we're trying to prevent somebody from being able to recover the key that allows them then to decrypt all of the communications. So, uh, so in, in like the case of TKIP, there were some theoretical weaknesses that were actually published. People started getting a little bit nervous. They started working on the next standard, and sure enough, by the time WPA2 came out, they were using pretty much straight AES and TCMP encryption uh, because by that point, somebody had taken the theoretical weaknesses, they had developed SAC mechanisms, and you know, going after WPA using TKIP, the recovery of that is usually in a matter of hours or so, um, and maybe, maybe longer in some cases. Now, let's go back and talk about WEP. Uh, one of the classes I teach for ISA is the TS-13 Advanced Industrial Cybersecurity course, and in that class where I taught it, 
we basically uh, I set up a WEP uh, WEP access point, and then I use the aircraft tools uh, and actually do injection of, of harmful or, or specifically crafted packets into that device. And yes, we re we recover a 64 bit key space in a in well, a matter of seconds. It's usually about 45 to 50 seconds or so by the time you recover a 64 bit key space. A 128-bit one key space, which is quite a bit larger, we're going to cover that in a matter of minutes. Now, you may say, wait a minute, WEP's been around for quite a while. We're not necessarily using that. Some people make fun of it. I will tell you, I find WEP-enabled devices a lot more often than I would like to like to say. Uh, I would say I find that probably utilities in particular tend to have WEP-encrypted devices at some point in their utility in about 60-70% of the cases I've seen that are using wireless. So it's still heavily used out there. Um, definitely, I would say move off of anything associated with WEP, and you want to move towards WPA, and I would skip right over WPA and go to WPA2. And if you really need strong authentication beyond that point, you start looking at those Radius and PACX servers and the 802.1x, because what you again, what you want to do with those, these uh, these better encryption is that again, if somebody can recover the key, then they're going to be able to read the they're going to be able to read your communications and intercept them. So the attack methodology here, when you can't break AES or TKIP, is you're going to use a brute force. You're just going to keep guessing potential keys until you actually gain a successful attack. And that is, there's a lot of techniques out there for doing that, which we won't really necessarily go into today. Suffice it to say, there's a lot of supercomputing technology or distributed computing that attempts to pre-compute all of the known possible hash values for a whole uh, standard, you know, 256 character A through Z, all uppercase, lowercase. Tries to pre-compute all of the known hashes that might work. So if somebody just to just plug the hash in of what they think the key is, then they could actually look up what the key is. They'd be able to break it. Um, so in that case, some of these, uh, you, you see the list of the three here. You could actually keep going down this bullet list. You could add in 802.1x, Radius and TACX servers, and, and WPA2 Enterprise. And then what we would be doing there is that we are changing the key space every few seconds. So that even if you do actually recover a key, by the time you're able to try to use that key, the key has already been changed to something else. So there are quite a few things here. Now, again, we're also looking at pretty much 802.11 uh, 802 encryption methods, methods on this slide. The potential list of encryption technologies out there for wireless goes on almost ad infinitum. So uh, we know there's lots of other stuff out there. What you're going to want to do is you want to know what, what is the me methodology, like WPA, WPA2, and WEP. Then you're going to want to understand what is the key management technique underneath that, and there is private key, public key, shared key, and then you're going to want to know what encryption algorithm they're actually using. And pretty much these days, I would I would shy away from anything that is not using AES. Uh, most of the other ones that are out there, there's two fish and blowfish. Those are also some fairly strong ones. Uh, but anything that's still using DESK, anything that's using anything proprietary in the encryption space, uh, typically are, are going to be weak in one way or another. So. AES is pretty much the best stuff out there. Sounds good, uh, Brian. So I think we can, uh, uh, some takeaways that uh, I'm reading from this are, uh, if you're part of the 60 or 70% that's got uh, a radio system that uses WEP, change it now. That's certainly uh, something that should be done uh, right away. And uh, the stronger the encryption, the better. And AES, I think, as you mentioned, as a minimum. Okay, the next thing uh, we wanted to uh, chat about is uh, there are some wireless intrusion prevention systems that are out there. And what these are, are these are uh, devices that you would uh, uh, install in a facility and they will scan the radio spectrum and alert you to the presence of uh, unauthorized uh, uh, devices there. And some of them uh, even can be quite uh, sophisticated. Uh, some of them can even uh, approximate the location of a rogue uh, piece of, uh, of equipment here. So uh, really quite interesting, uh, uh, quite interesting uh, technologies, but these do allow you some defense uh, to, uh, you know, to actively monitor uh, the spectrum and, and uh, be alerted that uh, somebody's plugged something in or powered something on that they uh, shouldn't have. Uh, Brian, would you like to uh, would you like to elaborate? Sure. Thank you. From wireless intrusion prevention, there's three things you have to watch out for. Number one, we want to make sure that we're actually monitoring for any device that's communicating with RF, and we're communicating in the same frequency space as our devices are. This is the jamming type activities. Again, that's pretty much just a denial of service. Somebody's jamming your signal; it's just not going to work. All right, but then what we're looking for is actual devices communicating in the frequency space, not necessarily what they're doing. 
So you also look for things like microwaves or other phones that might be interfering with your wireless communication and causing you some type of problem. The second aspect of this is wireless session management. These are all of the pre-commands and all of the things that are associated with access points and wireless access devices talking to each other that allow you to be able to go in, start your laptop up, browse, find the free hotel wireless connection, associate to it, and then you have your Wi-Fi connection. That's all of the stuff associated with access points talking to each other, computers talking to try to find, find what access points they can communicate with, etc. And then the third piece is once you are actually associated on the network, is what communications are going over the wire. This is where you're actually communicating with your Ethernet over uh, your, your TCP IP over wireless or something of that nature. All three of these have to basically be watched. Uh, I'll just talk briefly here from the from the, the hacker and cracker perspective. Is there's lots of tools out there that will try to do things like you said. There's rogue access points. There's also wireless. There's higher session hijacking access points. Uh, one of the tools out there that I carry in my bag of tricks is one known as Carmetasploit. Uh, or the Yasager tool set, J-A-S-A-G-E-R, which means yes man in German. Uh, the way that works is actually pretty clever. What it does is it says, you know, when, when your computer comes up, it looks for the last known wireless access point that you tried to connect to. So let's say you were attached to the Hilton Wireless or the Marriott Wireless or something like that. Then you, you disconnect from that and you go to the airport. Well, those access points obviously aren't valid at the airport. However, your computer is still looking for it. It doesn't know you disassociated. So what the Yasager device does and it says, yep, I'm the free Marriott Wi-Fi, or something of that nature. Your computer tries to associate to it, and then I pass your communications through to an otherwise valid network connection. So as far as you can tell, you're on the Internet. You didn't even notice anything happen. I'm actually going to be serving you your Internet connection from my device, but because I'm now, I've now ses hijacked that session, I can read, manipulate, and replay any of the traffic you're actually sending across that device. It's a, very, it's a very effective technique. In fact, as soon as I fire that device up, it basically starts doing its thing immediately. And I, I mean, I've done it in airports. I've done it in, you know, as part of obviously valid penetration tests. I've done it in various utilities. And it's just a matter of, of a few seconds. And I'm pretty well reading just about all the communications coming from the wireless devices out there. So if you're going to try to prevent those types of attacks, you're going to need to make sure that you're watching for what devices are out there in the RF spectrum in my frequency space. You're going to need to make sure that they are the valid access points that are supposed to be connecting. Those are identified by MAC address. They're identified by signature. You could be using things like 802.1x here as well to make sure that there's only valid access points established. And then there's lots of tools out there for actually helping to, to uh, as, as Mr. Cunningham pointed out, to, tr to detect really access, access points. Uh, in fact, we use little directional antennas and the, the, the tool set that uh, Brian mentioned earlier to find them in many cases. It's a very cheap format and solution for being able to do it. You can find them all day long. And then the third piece is going to be watching the communications that are actually going out over the air. There are tools out there like Wireshark, and there's also uh, the Snort intrusion detection for wireless, and there are quite a few tools out there. That you, but you're going to need to make sure that you, if, you want to, if you want to secure your wireless, you're going to have to have some level of, of, of inspection in all three of those levels to make sure that you do not have rogue access, rogue devices out there communicating in your environment. Yeah, that's great. Um, the uh, yeah, the my experience uh, there has been that uh, these wireless intrusion prevention systems uh, will work with 802.11 devices or uh, public uh, protocols. Uh, however, I have not seen any that will work with other frequencies, and that's where uh, little uh, uh, spectrum analyzers like uh, the device I was referring to, we both just referred to, uh, that you could purchase from a company called uh, MetaGeek. Uh, are, is a simple USB-based spectrum analyzer. So you can actually see what sort of interference or uh, who is transmitting. Now, it won't analyze the protocol or tell you whether that's a legitimate or invalid signal, but hopefully if you uh, are operating in a signal, you'll be able to recognize uh, that. And certainly if anybody is uh, jamming the airwaves with an excessive amount of RF traffic, uh, that would certainly uh, show up on a, on a tool like that. So I have to say that's been a, a very valuable uh, tool uh, for myself uh, uh, since I've acquired it. Okay, the next thing uh, we wanted to do is uh, just to give you some resources, uh, some other uh, websites, some other organizations uh, that you can uh, refer to. Uh, we also have some uh, some training courses that are offered by uh, ISA, and, and, and Mr. Singer actually uh, conducts uh, uh, some of those. And uh, also, in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, this is an example of an encryption box that you can uh, purchase. Uh, 
Uh, we, there, uh, obviously, there's uh, many legacy devices or uh, devices that use RS-232 ports or RS-485 ports, uh, and if they are being transmitted, if that data is being transmitted uh, over the air, a lot of those devices uh, may not have uh, suitable encryption or high enough level uh, encryption uh, built into them. What you can do is purchase these encryption boxes, and effectively they uh, will... Uh, they uh, fit in between a PLC and a radio system such that the data going into the encryption box uh, is encrypted, then it's delivered and transmitted to the radio system over the air. The receiving uh, radio receives that encrypted data, passes it through a decryption box, and it uh, then goes out to a, a PLC or computer system or SCADA system. So these are little boxes that you can buy and stick in between. Uh, to be able to encrypt uh, data, uh, serial data, uh, before it uh, goes over the air. Uh, Brian, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the the courses you offer and some of the other websites we have here? Sure. Uh, the, I think the, the main one, if you're looking for more information on industrial control system security, there's a couple of sources I would really, really point you at. I, I, they're not really in order here. Uh, I, I guess the shameless plug would be, since I ran the standard for so long and, and still heavily involved in it, would be the ISA 99 or the IEC 62443, uh, industrial Automation and Control System Security Standard. That's an ongoing standards body. There's a lot of activity going on over there. We actually have a working group that's dedicated towards wireless security issues, as a matter of fact. Matter of fact. Um, then the second resource that I would point you at would be the us-cert.gov slash control under bar systems. That is the Industrial Control Systems CERT, C-E-R-T, Computer Emergency Response Team Organization. That's sponsored by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Uh, there's also the, the pointy tip of the sphere for a number of international CERT organizations for industrial. It's just really kind of a clearinghouse. There's lots of good things up there about recommended practices. Uh, they also offer some, some interesting security, uh, security training classes up there when the government is in operation. Um, then we also have things like the ISA 100, Wireless for Industrial Automation Standard. That's uh, If you're not involved with ISA 100, if you're not familiar with that work, I would definitely encourage you to look into that. Then we have the U.S. Department of Energy funded a, store, a study a couple of few years ago for a next generation secure and scalable wireless technology uh, they called hybrid spread spectrum. I was actually on that project for a couple of years. Uh, and so that's actually some, some potential alternate technologies to things like Zigbee for mesh and then point to point communications in a low power, uh, low, power low data rate uh, uh, in distributed environment like power, oil and gas, water, any of those types of utilities. Um, then, again, I think we mentioned there's the ICS-32, which is an introduction to industrial automation control system security. Uh, I would encourage folks to maybe even look at going to the next one, which is the ISA-TS-13, which is a advanced industrial cybersecurity training course. It's a hands-on course. And, again, when I teach that class, we do hands-on hacking right there and the, also actually you know, show manipulation of devices and turning things on and off and flipping screens around and using, the, uh, using, the open, source, using open source tools to do that. I actually will demonstrate that in those courses. And then, uh, again, ISA 100 wireless, so I think we've actually doubled up there. Uh, but then there's the NIST 800-53 and the 800-82. Those are security standards for federally mandated utilities. The 882 is the one for the industrial control system side. I highly recommend those. They were actually developed a lot in concert with the ISA 99 work in the beginning days. And there may be ones that if you're in a U.S. utility that's federally regulated in any way, you may actually fall under the NIST guidelines in this particular case. So there's plenty of stuff out there. One more that's not mentioned here is the WSISAC, or the Water Systems Information uh, Sharing and Coordination. Uh, if you're not associated with your local uh, WSISAC in, the, in North America, I highly encourage you to do so because they will start telling you quite a bit about what's going on in the field of industrial security. Uh, there's also, I guess, the other one would be the FBI's InfraGuard. Uh, that uh, this may, you may have local chapters of your IFI, the FBI InfraGuard for those in the U.S. And then outside of the U.S., there are uh, organizations in most of the countries uh, that are, well, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of countries, a lot of the larger countries in particular, have similar organizations that are into the ICS CERT. M many have uh, multinational CERT organizations. Uh, so there's, there's, there's definitely guidance and help out there. And if you still can't find anything, I, I certainly would always point people back at ISA 99, which is a multinational organization, hundreds of members, lots of different documents under development, and it is a very good clearinghouse of, of uh, information for security in general. And like I said, specific, there is a specific working group dedicated to wireless as well. Great. Excellent. Okay, so uh, lastly, we're just uh, wrapping up the uh, 
uh, our uh, presentation here. We're just about uh, finished here. So uh, a couple of recommendations uh, that we had here. Uh, the first is uh, is physical security. Uh, that should be step number one, is uh, making sure that people can't get into your uh, uh, pump stations or remote uh, locations or whatnot there. Uh, video surveillance monitoring, if that's possible, uh, or simple door switches or electrical cabinet enclosure door uh, switches can be uh, very effective in letting you know if anybody has uh, opened up these cabinets and done something they shouldn't have done. Next, we have uh, encryption is uh, primarily uh, your best uh, defense, but at the same time, it's uh, we need to uh, uh, make sure that the equipment is designed to be fail-safe. So, uh, so that if we do ever have any uh, uh, reliability issues with the signal or we lose it or somebody uh, jams the signal uh, somehow, that it shuts down in a safe manner that doesn't damage uh, anything. And then we have to think about uh, all those different encryption standards that we uh, chat about uh, that gradually evolved over time. So it's uh, important that your uh, wireless system allows for things like firmware upgrades that can take uh, advantage of the latest uh, enhancements in encryption uh, technology so that your uh, network can involve and be, uh, evolve and be updated as uh, encryption standards uh, evolve. Then we have to think about when, uh, when an individual leaves an organization. Uh, change the passwords, the access codes, the keys, and particularly in the case of the gentleman uh, Vitek Bowden who hacked that Australian uh, water wastewater uh, network, uh, if the relations are strained with the, that particular individual, do so immediately. That's one of the key uh, aspects of it. Then, as we as as uh, we uh, learned from that uh, particular case, train staff to be able to recognize what a cyber attack is uh, going to look like, and then have a plan in place to be able to deal with it. Initially, as we mentioned, that uh, the Marucci Shire in in Australia, there they did not recognize uh, that they were under attack. Initially, they thought it was just uh, uh, bugs in the system, a brand new system being commissioned. Fairly normal to have some some bugs in it. So certainly, uh, trained staff to be aware of what a cyber attack can look like. And uh, of course, uh, related to that is to have a good monitoring and logging system to make attack detection easier. If you don't, if you can't uh, record this sort of data and, and monitor this sort of thing, it's very difficult to be able to look at trends and be able to see who made what changes when, and then be able to determine or verify if those were legit, legitimate uh, changes here. And I'm going to advance it uh, one more uh, slide here and uh, ask you uh, if uh, a vehicle was parked outside of your facility uh, just beyond the chain link uh, fence and he had this kind of equipment and especially an antenna sticking up there, would this raise a concern? So the point from this particular uh, graphic here is uh, that uh, staff should be the eyes and the ears of the organization. Uh, they need to be aware that anybody sitting on the outside of a perimeter for any extended period of time, especially if it looks like they've got a bunch of electronic equipment, might uh, certainly raise some eyebrows. Uh, might be worth, uh, you know, uh, speaking to the authorities or finding out just why and what that individual is uh, is is doing there. Uh, Brian, would you like to add any any additional uh, recommendations? Well, I, I think you covered it pretty well. I think what I'd say is, as you look at that last slide you just showed there with the um, with all the equipment, that was how Vitek Bowden was caught. He was caught by a police officer that saw that uh, saw him driving around the facility. And said, "Hey, this is kind of interesting. What does all this stuff say? Property of you know of Queensland water wastewater or something of that nature?" Um, yeah, well, and that was how he basically they went to the utility and said, "Well, you know, we found all this equipment, this guy with it." And that's when they started finally started going, "Hmm. Well, we just thought we had something else going on. Maybe that explains why we had all these issues happening." So again, it, it, that due diligence, making sure that you watch your area of influence, area of responsibility, and that you have people trained to keep an eye out for such things. There's always there's there's always a good case for that. And I think what I would do, the last thing I would say is, again, there is, there's, always a, there's always appropriate technology that's fit for purpose. And if I could encourage everybody to do anything, it would just be to make sure that you go through a solid design, selection, commissioning, and validation process to make sure that the equipment you put out there is not introducing security risks. And there are plenty of resources out there to help you, and there are lots of folks like those that are on the phone today that could, uh, could, they could point you in the right direction if need be. So with that, that's all I have. Great, great, excellent. Uh, thank you. And I'm wondering if we have one more uh, 
slide here. Oh, here we go. Uh, yeah, uh, Brian, I just wanted to thank you for uh, coming out and and, uh, and and speaking today. Uh, uh, folks, I'd like you to recognize that uh, Mr. Singer is definitely a real expert uh, in this uh, uh, in this field, and uh, we have our contact info on this uh, particular uh, slide right here. So uh, this is how you can get a hold of us if you have any questions uh, at a later date. is uh, probably best uh, by email here. But uh, certainly want to thank Mr. Singer for uh, uh, for coming out and joining us here and providing some extremely valuable uh, information uh, uh, to us all to make sure our wireless systems are are secure. Um, thank you very much. Well, I appreciate it. Sure. Uh, just backing up for a second here, uh, uh, we uh, I'm sure Michaela is probably going to mention this in uh, just a minute, Our uh, Michaela Cooper, our uh, host with ISA, and that is that we do have the uh, ISA show uh, Automation Week coming up. Uh, it's taking place November 5th through 7th in uh, Nashville, uh, Tennessee, where uh, I will be there uh, myself. I will be uh, uh, presenting uh, on uh, some wireless uh, topics. Uh, and, of course, there should be lots of uh, good automation equipment, good chance to uh, be able to meet uh, people firsthand and uh, find out what new business and technology is out there to uh, to be able to enhance uh, our uh, automation uh, systems. Uh, Michaela, where do we uh, – I'll turn it over to our session uh, uh, organizer, uh, Michaela. Yes, thank you both. Uh, it was wonderful. I appreciate the time and effort you guys have put into this, and I'm sure everybody listening also got a little bit something out of this. Thank you.